Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. Today, we will be talking about Tenant. So I got to see Tenet earlier in the summer. There was a screening for local critics. It was like six people. We all wore masks in an auditorium that had like room for like 300 seats. So like everyone was fine. Uh, but why Adam wisely was like, I don't really want to risk my life to see Tenet. <laughs> and so like a lot of people just waited until now when Tenet just hit 4K. So we're going to dive into spoilers on this film. We're going to talk about where it fits into Christopher Nolan's filmography. If you want our podcast on just Christopher Nolan's previous films, we did that earlier this year. So go check that out. But this episode will be just about Tenet. Um, and in that previous episode, I, I briefly gave my thoughts on Tenet, but I didn't want to go too much into it because like, who knows when anyone would be able to see it. Now people are able to see it. And now I'll be a lot more candid about Tenet. Uh, <laughs> but before I get there, Adam, what did you think about Tenet? Man, it's a lot of movie. I had, uh, I watched it in 4k. I got the 4k Blu-ray, um, which looks great. Visually it's stunning. Uh, but I came away with it feeling a little similar to my first viewing of Batman versus Superman, where I was just like, there's a lot to process, <laughs> just like a lot thrown at me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I have weird feelings about it because there were aspects of it I absolutely hated. There were aspects of it that I had a lot of fun with. There were aspects of it that are super frustrating. I mean, uh, I don't know. I kind of want to watch it again, <laughs> but it is also befuddling. It's uh, I think the most interesting thing to to say about Tenet is that it is what Chris Nolan thinks a very straightforward Fast and Furious style blockbuster is. But he misunderstands very major aspects of what makes those kinds of movies work. Yeah, I, I genuinely think it is his worst movie. And and I say that with sort of in the back of my mind being like, I could I could still stand to revisit it. But I definitely think it's it's a film that fails because. You have this sort of so it's big conceit, it's big narrative conceit is the time inversion. And it's so poorly explained that even the characters kind of just throw up their hands and be like, you got to feel it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't think about it, just feel it, which is to me a really lazy way of storytelling, <laughs> which is to say, like, it's to me, it's like, yeah, it really is the, the Christopher Nolan equivalent of turn off your brain and enjoy the popcorn. And I don't want to turn off my brain. And I also think like Christopher Nolan is like, if you, if you're going to come up with this big convoluted thing this big thing of like time is moving we're going I, I basically created a palindromic structure so that the first half of the film moves forward and then the second half of the movie film moves backwards and i'm gonna like get it down to the precise detail of like if a car explodes you're gonna get really cold because inverted heat becomes cold like if you're getting it down to that detail then do us the 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 courtesy of explaining what you what you mean explain to me why certain objects can move backwards, but not everyone is moving backwards. Like explain to me why you can catch a bullet in a gun and go up a building, but like you're not talking backwards or you're not like, why are some things forward and some things backwards? Like why, I never understood like why are some things inverted and others aren't, you know? Like why, why is time moving in different directions at different, you know, in different ways? And it's just, I feel like it's very poorly told. It's physics, it, Matt. Just learn physics and it's fine. Just if you you're learn reversing the physics, entropy. Yeah. Okay. But why can <laughs> some things invert it, reverse em entropy and some can't? Like, <laughs> I mean, we're burnt. Like, why aren't we getting cold all the time? If our bodies, are, like, I don't understand. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> the, again, you're, it's really mad. And, but here's the thing I would actually be able to, to kind of hang with all of that. In the same way that, like, I think we hang with Inception, even though Inception raises, like, its own questions about, like, you know, what's the dream? What's the reality? You know, what's this technology that allows people to share dreams? And, you know, what does that mean? And who's the dreamer? And, and, and uh, Inception raises its own questions. But, A, I think it's handled in a much better manner. It's far more straightforward. Uh, and, B, there are character stakes. And that's the problem with, with Tenet is it doesn't really have character stakes. I had someone like angrily tweet at me. It's like, it has four deep emotional character arcs. And I'm like, where, <laughs> where your main character is called the protagonist. And he's like, I'm here to save the day. 
And then you have Elizabeth Debicki and she's like, I want to save my child because I am a mother. And then you have the villain, Sator, and he's like, I want to live forever, but I'm not. So I'm going to make sure everyone dies with me, which actually I thought was kind of interesting. I, I thought that was at least <laughs> yeah. as far as super villain motives goes, like if I can't live, no one gets to live. That was actually kind of interesting. And yeah. then it's like the Robert Pattinson being like, we are buddies. And, that sort of, <laughs> and those are your characters. <laughs> we are buddies. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think uh, so. First and foremost, in, in terms of the complex structure, I think it is incoherent. I think, you know, for the first 45 minutes or so, not only was I struggling to understand like how the mechanics of it worked and what was going on, but also the sound mix is so muddled. And I'm sure we'll get to that in a minute. But like, this is something Nolan is doing experimentally. Like, he is. he has said that he doesn't really think it matters if you can hear all the dialogue or not. But when you have a movie is, you know, narratively complex as Tenet, you do need to, because I didn't know what John David Washington's job was. Like, I was like, I think I heard the word CIA, but I don't know. Like, I don't know what world he came from. Is he an assassin? Like, I don't know what he is. Therefore, it's hard for me to latch on and care about what he's doing. Um, but the mechanics of explaining time inversion, and it tries to do it a couple of times, I, I think the best point of comparison is Inception. And in Inception, that very first set piece, uh, where they're in the dream in Ken Watanabe's palace or whatever. And then you cut to them, um, you know, uh, uh, with the kick in the bathtub. And then you cut to them on like the a train. On a train. Yeah. So it's visual language. It's visual storytelling explaining to you exactly what's going on. And there's also, you know, uh, like dialogue is also kind of explaining how it works. But you're getting very clear visual rep representations like Nolan has explained to you in visual language how this works. And then he does it a couple more times in Inception and, and it makes perfect sense. I don't think Inception is a confusing movie once you kind of get into its groove and it gives you a couple of chances to understand it. But also Inception is fun. Like that movie has joy. <laughs> Those characters are interesting. Uh, you know, Tom Hardy is funny. John uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt is is a lot of fun. And then you also care about the characters. So the big, uh, you know, I've, I was talking to you, Matt, about this. Like, there's the story that when Nolan first presented Inception to Leonardo DiCaprio, Maul was Cobb's partner, not his wife. And DiCaprio wisely was like, we need an emotional hook here. What if it was his wife? And that kind of changed and recontextualized the story. Now you have emotional stakes for that character. Now you understand why he doesn't want to get rid of Maul. Now you understand why he's willing to sacrifice so much to keep her there. And then you have the guilt and everything. That all makes sense. Tenet. Couldn't tell you what the protagonist cares about. Couldn't tell you, you know, what his motivation is other than being nice to this lady. <laughs> like, I just, and it, then it makes you hard to care about what he's doing. And I think John David Washington is a, a tre tremendously talented performer, but he's given basically nothing here. And there are a couple of lines, and, uh, you know, Kyler's a, Collider's own Greg Smith wrote a really nice uh, rebuttal to all of this. So if you like Tenet, you can read it on Collider essentially defending Tenet as this big, silly, goofball popcorn movie. Um, and I think it's a really compelling read and a really interesting read. And you can see that Nolan is trying to give the protagonist like fun, like one liners and stuff. But to me, they just fall flat. It's just not fun. No, it's it's sort of, you know, even before this film came out, like Christopher Nolan's like, I'm a big James Bond fan. I love spy films. Um, and this is sort of his attempt to make that spy film. Yeah. But if you it's sort of in a weird way, kind of a preview of like, what if Christopher Nolan made a James Bond film? And the answer is it would be pretty bad because like it, it would be bad. I will. Although I will say it would be bad in a way that is different than a lot of way James Bond movies are bad. And I can say that now that I spent this year, I, earlier this year, I watched all of them. And <laughs> next year, you'll finally get to read what I think about them. We're going to see No Time to Die and do our big Bond podcast literally a year after we were scrambling to prep for our No Time to Die podcast. Right, exactly. Well, there's still time. I mean, because you haven't, you didn't finish your your watch, did you? Did I stopped you, like, stop? after the first Dalton, and so okay. I have the rest to go, and so I'll be a little bit fresher on those. But I was, because I was like, man, the deadline's coming, and I've got, I wanted to watch all of them, and I was just like barreling through, and then it was like, and like wisely so, it was a smart decision to delay it, but I was like, <sighs> So all those like nights that I was like up watching, I got to see the spy movies. who loved me. <laughs> yeah. Watching Octopussy and just like, uh, but, but we'll way, get to that. Yeah. But the way Tenet is bad is that it's just, it, it's not, you're right. It's not fun. It's also oddly sexless. Yeah. And 
oddly in the sense that like it's odd for a James Bond film to be sexless. It is not odd for a Christopher Nolan movie to be sexless. Um, and it's just it ha- like you have John David Washington and Elizabeth Debicki, who are two very attractive people, and all they manage is a chaste kiss on the lips. <laughs> It's very like, and I just think like James Bond, like part of its appeal is that it is sexy and it is dangerous. And like, I think Christopher Nolan knows how to put together a set piece, but is like the dialogue fun? Is it witty? Not really. Are the character, like it, it doesn't really, it's just very cold and mechanical. It's sort of in a weird way embodying it's almost like a parody of a Christopher Nolan movie. Like it's what his detractors sort of say are his worst qualities all kind of bundled into one film. Well, and honestly, I would say if you want to see what a Christopher Nolan Bond movie looks like, watch Skyfall. Cause I feel like Skyfall does it better than Nolan would do at this point. Mm -hmm. Cause there is an emotion. There's a really strong emotional hook to that movie, but that movie is also fun. Um, I don't know. I love that film, but you're right. And Tenet, and I think the only character who really kind of livens the place up is Robert Pattinson. And it's because, you know, there's something more there from their very first meeting. You know, there's something mysterious about him. You know, there's something else. There has to be something else driving him to do all of this. And that makes him compelling. Whereas the protagonist is just seemingly doing it out of the goodness of his heart, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> don't know why he's putting himself through all of this. And to Bicky, you know, she's a great actress and I think she does what she can with her, you know, I want to save my son storyline, but you're right. It is sex. It's uh, not just sexless. It's just joyless. There's no. Yeah. And there's nothing particularly fresh. I mean, even Kenneth Branagh was kind of a snooze. Cause yeah, I would like, can someone explain to me how this villain is, is significantly different than his Russian villain in Jack Ryan yeah. shadow recruit. I cannot. Yeah. And I've seen both films. I, I yeah. can't tell you how they're different. No. Um, and, and so I just feel like tenant, doesn't work on the levels. Like I, I, again, I also don't really know what Christopher Nolan is going for other than like, I came up with this cool time inversion conceit and I want to blend it with a spy thriller. Okay. That's a good starting point, but you didn't do any of the groundwork. And I wrote an article. The thing that frustrates me most about time inversion is that it is a gimmick because when you don't use your storytelling device to illuminate character or theme, then it just exists on its own. And that, and that is a gimmick. So like when people say like, Oh, memento going backward is a gimmick. I'm like, no, that actually puts you in the mind of Leonard Shelby. And that helps you perceive time as he perceives it. And that sort of short term memory. And when you get into his headspace, then you feel for him as a character and what he's going through. And it really sort of, uh, emphasize the theme of like, do your actions have meaning if you can't remember them? Yeah. And I think that's really important. And Tenet doesn't have any of that. Like the, the fact that the time, like time is running backwards tells us nothing about any of these characters. They're just happen to be involved in the fact that there is a algorithmic device (laughs) that can send time backwards or inverted or whatever. Like, and, but it doesn't affect, it's not like, Oh, it's not like the protagonist is like, I wish I could undo these mistakes that I have made. Like, no, he's just a guy. Yeah. Even inception inception is a film about guilt and, and trying to, um, uh, you know, like being in denial about things that you kind of lock away in the back of your brain and that inception, the idea of, you know, going back into your memories and, you know, confronting face to face, this goes from your past, I think makes a lot of sense. Tenet, I mean, it's so confusing that like the third act is a really, and we should say like, technically, I think this movie is astounding. I think the cinematography is fantastic. It's one of my favorite scores of the year. There, there are technical elements that I think I agree with you. Like, Cinematography, Hoy Van Hoytema is great. Uh, Ludwig Göransson's score is really good. I even like the Travis Scott song over the end credits. I think that's <laughs> a really good song. Um, but, you know, also sound design is tech and yeah. that's abysmal. Well, I meant like it, the production design, like everything yeah. that went into so my point being like the third act is really like visually pretty mm-hmm. stunning. But I it, like I was spending the whole time trying to figure out how it worked because I didn't understand the mechanics of the story. Yeah, so I, like, I couldn't care about what the protagonist was doing because I was like, wait, so Pattinson is, mm, is he in the contain? Mm. And I was just like, as all of this stuff was like wheels are returning and I was like, the buildings go, okay, the building go, like you're just like, it's trying to do math while someone's telling you a story. And yeah. I was like, doesn't, it doesn't land. 
it's sort of like, I mean, by the time you have Aaron Taylor Johnson being like, we're going to execute a temporal pincer move. I was like, I'm out. <laughs> Thank you. Cause like at that point it's like, I don't like what, what is this even happening? Like, I don't, don't, this is not exciting for me. Yeah. And like, there are some films where I get it where it's sort of like you're either in or you're out, but I'm going to give you enough compelling stuff to, to, to convince you to stay in. And I don't think Tenet ever offers that. That's the yeah. issue. It's like, I'm not like, what emotional stakes am I sticking around for? Like I can kind of put up with a lot of like, you know, this is, this doesn't, isn't going to make a lot of sense, but the emotional stakes are going to like, that's to me is almost like a David Lynch film where it's like, yeah. you're just absorbing it rather than sort of being like, I will tell you what is happening. But Tenet doesn't have that. It's, and I would hesitate even to call it cerebral. I would just say it's more just overbearing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a mismatch. It's a mismatch of narrative device and the story you're telling and the characters you have, like they just don't really fit together. It hasn't, he hasn't found the right way to make those puzzle pieces work hand in hand. Although I will say by the end of the film, I was really compelled and I would almost be excited to watch a sequel because the idea that Pattinson has, you know, met, the protagonist before that they are buddies they have been buddies that they're in somewhere in time and space they have been working together towards this common goal i think it's really fascinating and and the protagonist you know coming to realize that oh i'm the one who ran this entire operation but i want to see how all that got started like, i think it's like a movie that's working backwards to get to the starting point and the starting point is almost more exciting than where you know you've been throughout the entire film right yeah and and it's just but also, I don't know how that works. <laughs> like, has Robert Pattinson been like in one of those chambers, just writing backwards for like 15 years, trying to get back? To yeah, there the are film? like that's the other thing. There are like literal time machines in this film yeah. that exist at certain points. But like, how did the time machines get there? And like, how do they work? And like, can anyone use the time machine? And like, it's... and the time machines appear to work in real time. So like. If you want to go back seven days, you have to start, you have to sit in backwards time for seven days. So um, if Robert Pattinson's character knows John David Washington's character, how far into the future and why has he not aged and all of those questions. Right. And then it's sort of like, you know, when you say that, it's like, it kind of reminds me of Primer, but Primer only cost $10,000 yeah. and it was like an independent film. Whereas yeah. this is like Warner Brothers, like one of their biggest movies of the year, and it's just indecipherable. Can we, by the way, take a side note of the fact of like this tortured Warner Brothers Christopher Nolan relationship <laughs> for a second, where it's just like Warner Brothers basically bent over backwards for Christopher Nolan this year. Like they were like, Tenant, we're going to pretend it's the movie that's bringing back cinemas. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to eat. Like, first off, I would, I would pause it. And obviously, I can't prove it. No one can prove it. That in a normal year, if Tenet had been released, like if, if the pandemic hadn't happened and Tenet had been released this July as planned, I think it would have been a flop. I don't think it would have. I think it would have had a big opening weekend and then plummeted because the word of mouth on it would have been toxic. I think a lot of people would have exited and be like, I don't understand it. And I didn't have fun with it. Um, and I think so. I, I think it would have been one of Fritz Nolan's less successful films. And I think it, it, the pandemic has kind of covered up the fact like he can now say like it would have been a hit if not for the pandemic. Um, and there's no way to know, but you know, Warner brothers kind of did everything that he wanted, you know, like we're going to give it a theatrical release. We're not going to release it on streaming. We're not going to We're not going to shelve it to 2022 or 2021. You know, we're going to release it because we want the income and, and you're all about the theatrical experience. We're going to do it. And it, and it underperformed. And then Warner Brothers is like, okay, well, we don't want more tenants on our hand, so we need to do a hybrid strategy. And Warner Brothers, and Christopher Nolan's like, fuck you! <laughs> How dare you? The worst streaming service! <laughs> <laughs> what a big flex. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it has grossed uh, over $360 million worldwide. So... I think it would have been one of his low, lower grossing films. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I don't think his logic is entirely flawed in that, okay, like there is an ego in I'm going to bring back movie theaters, but you also look at historically at Christopher Nolan's films, they do bring out a lot of people to come to see them. They're big event sized movies. They do. So if but if there was it like, were safe, it, if, if we yeah. had been in like a vaccine environment, like, yeah, that probably would have been, been a good, good bet. But I do agree. I mean, there would have been I was talking to someone the other day and they're like, man, Inception is so confusing. And I was like, don't watch Tenet. Like if you thought Inception was confusing, like you're not going to you can't hang with Tenet at all. I just, just going to find it. obtuse. Yeah. It's just weird to me that Christopher Nolan has shown way more 
it, throughout this entire year, he's been far more adamant about preserving the theatrical experience than like, I hope people don't get sick and die. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. like at any point, like he could have like, see, and this is where to me the argument becomes bullshit. Because I was told by a very angry publicist for Christopher Nolan that, you know, Christopher Nolan doesn't get to tell Warner Brothers what to do. He's he's adhering to their thing. He's not going to speak out. But the second this HBO Max deal came out, he was like, fuck Warner Brothers. And he said it loudly and publicly and didn't care and said it from the rooftops. And now it's like, where will he go next? But earlier this summer, he did not. For some reason, he was remarkably tight lipped about being like, I don't think Warner Brothers should release my movie in a pandemic. I would be happier if they just sat on it until 2021 when it's safer to go to theaters again. But he didn't say that. He just said he just stayed quiet and let the and then it's like it's out of my hands. Yeah. So I guess my argument is is like you can be loud when you want to be loud, but the yeah. thing you're choosing to be loud about is I don't like streaming services. Well, and he wields an inordinate amount of power. Like he, by everyone in the nose admission, he is the person who saved film. He is the one who rallied the troops. He got Spielberg. He got Edgar Wright, Judd Apatow, PTA, everyone together. Um, they went to the studios, the movie studios, and said, we need you to commit to buying X amount of film stock from Kodak per year to keep them in business. And the movie studios were like, yeah, sure, great, got it, we'll do it. Um, because it was on the verge of that, Kodak was going to shut down because people weren't buying film stock. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he knows the power of his words, and I think that's why he's speaking out against Warner Brothers now um, when it suits him. And I don't think he's wrong. I think Warner Brothers' decision to release their entire slate on HBO Max could end up hurting a lot of those films. Yeah, and that's the thing. I don't think he, like that argument is necessarily wrong. Yeah. Uh, I certainly was done without any buy-in from the filmmakers. Yeah. And I think that's exactly. that's wrong. I'm not saying his argument is wrong. I'm saying it's interesting that he chose to make a public statement now instead yeah. of July. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. It's very much like pick and choose your battles. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it was a It was a hugely bungled release. And it was very fascinating to see how he dug in because Denis Villeneuve uh, released a statement about the HBO Max deal and said when he was presented with the idea to push Dune back to October 2021, he was like, yes, absolutely. Perfect choice. That's what we should do. Um, so it's not like other major filmmakers aren't, you know, pushing for that kind of thing uh, yeah. when they're talking to the studios. And look, I get like Warner Brothers is like, you know, we we need to, you know, we have these we can't just have these movies sitting around forever. But with Tenet, I just feel like they're needed. Like we were nowhere, like we were hitting a second wave over the summer. Yeah. So this notion that like, oh, it'll be fine by Labor Day. Like this is not, this was never rooted in reality. It was never rooted in reality that it was, it was going to be safe to go back to movie theaters, no matter how many seats you spray down with disinfectant for an airborne virus. Yes. Yeah. Perform <laughs> performative uh, disinfecting. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's very frustrating the way that turned out. And, it, you know, this may go down as the lost Nolan film, the film, the Nolan film that no one saw. Because <laughs> I think people. And I always, and I always thought years. that would be Insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, that's still kind of the lost Nolan film. I don't think anyone uh, is speaking out super passionately about that one. But it is interesting because for this guy who I mean, Interstellar did well, but Interstellar did not do like the Dark Knight numbers. Um I can't remember exactly how Interstellar did. I'd be curious to know. But I mean, uh, well, while you're checking on that, like the thing about Interstellar is it's like Interstellar, like Christopher Nolan, and I'm looking at my camera right now and like the sunlight is like hitting me like right <laughs> as like as bars on my face through my blinds. Um, cells interlinked, interlinked cells. <laughs> <laughs> Doing the Blade Runner test. <laughs> um, but the thing about Interstellar is that like it is, is Interstellar is like almost all emotional core. Yeah. Yeah. It's all there. So it's not like Nolan is incapable of that. I still think he misses the mark from time to time. But at least that film is like, no, no, that's very much a father daughter story. And like, yeah, there's about the story. There's stuff about time dilation and things like that. But honestly, that stuff works because, again, it's in service of the characters. So when, you know. Matthew McConaughey misses his his children's entire lot, like 20 years of their lives basically like that hits because you care yeah. about those stakes rather than being like, what if 20 years just go by and now you yeah. have to disarm the device? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> yeah, their coworker got old, but that's about it. <laughs> that, was, that was the only thing it cost. <laughs> oh man, you look terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still young. Uh, yeah, so Interstellar made six hundred ninety-six million dollars worldwide. Inception made eight hundred thirty-six million worldwide. So you know they've always been in terms of Nolan's films. It's always been this. Um, uh, you know, studios want the next Inception because 836 million worldwide for an, or an original film is astounding. Like yeah. that's a really terrific performance. And Dunkirk even made 526 million, which is, you know, for a World War II film is really great. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, in Dunkirk. OK, so let's talk about Dunkirk for a second, because we talked about this before and you brought up this point. Like Dunkirk has super thin characters, but the entire conceit of that film is to be experiential. You're supposed to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the fighter pilot, of the kid on the beach and of the people on the boats. And you do. It's a really terrific uh, piece of storytelling in that in that regard, I think. Yeah, that's the thing about Dunkirk. I was like, Dunkirk is sort of like. It's almost in a weird way, like Christopher Nolan took the wrong lesson from Dunkirk. He's like, oh, I don't really need characters because <laughs> if you can just make people experience, if you can just make them feel it, then you're there. And it's like, but Dunkirk actually fucking happened. And like, you don't need to tell people like, oh, the stakes of World War Two. Like, it's a real event that affected real people. So the life and death stakes are built in as opposed to the made up time inversion thing. It is very fascinating to me because I do think uh, throughout Nolan's career, he's a he's proved that he's a very gifted visual storyteller. He's yeah. good at using cinema and all the tools at his disposal, uh, you know, visual sound, music, all of this stuff to uh, create compelling stories and to explain things like using the language of cinema. And Tenet is just such a misfire in that regard. Yeah, it's it's again, that's the thing. Like, if you want to. If you're going to be a filmmaker, it's like, okay, I, you know, we re we rely too much on dialogue as it is. So I'm going to create this really weird sound mix that you can't really hear anything. That's fine. I'm totally fine with filmmakers conveying story points through visual language rather than dialogue. The problem is, is that you've created a situation where you've created a conceit that is so complex that it can only be untangled through dialogue and then you've covered up the dialogue. Yeah. So there's no way for me to visually understand what you're talking about because it's already this very over lab, you know, overly done conceit of time inversion. There's no way to be like, oh, you don't need to hear. And also when people do say about it, they always seem to cop out, you know, in their dialogue. Yeah. So they'll be saying like, it's like this and this and this and the physics and the this and that, but you just have to feel it. Or like, you know, Robert Renz, like Robert Renz, like, oh, you know, it's the grandfather parable. If you went back in time, da, 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 but don't worry about that. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So why are we, if your own characters at the end of their things are being like, don't worry about it. Like, it's almost like all the characters just give up on explaining <laughs> something. And they're like, you know what? It's better if I show you. And then they <laughs> show it and you're like, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm still confused. Give me a diagram, please. <laughs> I, I, after I saw the movie, I went Googling and there's a, a, like entire insane Reddit threads devoted to that one car on the highway. And how did it get there in the first place? And where did it come from? The one that flips backwards and all of that stuff. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't, doesn't track. And, and I, I understand that, uh, I'm sure the thing of the character saying, don't worry about it was Nolan trying to give the audience permission to just feel it. You can't just feel it when you don't understand what's happening. Yeah. Well, and, and you can't feel it if there are no character stakes. That's yes. the other, that's the <laughs> yeah. other half of it. If there are no character stakes, if there's no, and character stakes beyond like a one word definition beyond like save the world, my save, my child, save my friend. Yeah. Or Kenneth Branagh being like, I don't want anyone else to live. Like it just, it has to be, there has to be more there than those are, those are, that's a starting point, but they're like, there's no texture or nuance to any of that stuff. And it's also like there, I would also say like the film has a problem, like it kind of, it, one of its main problems kind of reminds me of, of rise of Skywalker, which is the chase, the doodad problem. Mm -hmm. Cause like the first part of 10 is like, we have to get the painting. And then we get to the painting and it's like, no, you don't really need a painting. You need to get to this. 
And then it's like you give a third act, it's like you have to get to the device. And then it's like, I don't want to keep chasing MacGuffins. Give me a thing. Yeah. Like, stop chasing doodads. Yeah. Or if you have a doodad to chase, have a really compelling group of characters like mm-hmm. Inception or an ulterior motive. Like, it's not actually about the doodad, it's about Cobb getting to Maul. Right, well, exactly. It has to be something to drive character. Yeah. And it's just the plot. Again, the plotting on Tenet is if you were to. If you were to remove the time inversion stuff, I don't, I don't want to say if you remove the time inversion stuff, because I hate it when people like if you change the thing that makes it the thing, well, <laughs> then it'd be something else. But if you look at it from just a spy thriller perspective, it's just not a particularly good spy thriller. It's it's fancy, like it has very clean action and the characters wear great suits. Um, it's very expensive and classy. But as if if you were like, what's a great spy thriller? I wouldn't say Tenant. Like I would point people elsewhere like Skyfall. The Man from Uncle, for God's sake. Oh, The Man from Uncle. Another the most charming, <laughs> sexy spy thriller of yes, the Yes, and, and you still get Elizabeth Debicki. As the villain, no less. And yeah. she's fantastic in it. Yeah, Man from Uncle stands here. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, a, and again, I'm eager to see it again, kind of, now that I kind of have a better handle on what's going on and see if I, it, like, I'm curious to see if I fully understand the mechanics of the story. Is the movie that much more enjoyable for me? And I suspect, suspect probably not, but, you know, I also, you know, it's, it's nice to see some of those uh, practical effects and stuff, but. I don't know. I, I I'm not writing Nolan off. Like I I will still be first in line to see whatever he does next. But yeah, no. I mean this. Yeah, this isn't gonna like kill his career or anything. But like, yeah. I mean, he probably will be making his next movie not at Warner Brothers. <laughs> yeah. God, imagine if he made a movie at Disney. That'd be funny. That would be funny. That would be funny. I want to make I want to make an Aladdin prequel. <laughs> like, <laughs> Christopher Nolan's Star Wars: The Rise of Palpatine. <laughs> man talk about breaking the internet <laughs> um but yeah so yeah tenant i you know i feel like it's a lot of it, it sort of it earned this weird reputation because of being this this lone holdout over the summer like the one film that would not shift would not change its release yeah. date needed to be seen in theaters and then it sort of kind of was but not really and now people are finally seeing it at home and you know, Nolan's doing press for it at home. Like that's the thing. Yeah. I, it's not like he's like, ah, I will never. I refuse to even acknowledge it. He's like, no, he's doing press for, for the home release. Yeah. Um. But you know, so. it is what it is. Be curious to see. What, as more people see it, I'll be curious to see what the general audience uh, reception is. I, I will be too. Um. Some people are r- real mad, and some people are like, oh, that's great. And I think I don't know. It's. It's fine that it's divisive. I don't think that's a that's a strike against it. I just for me it doesn't work. Yeah. But I'm glad I can finally talk to people about it. I haven't been able to talk to anyone about it because no one fucking saw it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Uh well with that, let's move into recently watched. What have you seen lately? Uh so I watched The Midnight Sky, which is George Clooney's uh next directorial effort, uh be released on Netflix uh on Wednesday, I think Christmas. December twenty third. Or is it Christmas oh, December twenty third? Oh, then Wednesday. Yeah. So let me just double check. Yeah, I think so. Somewhere it'll be online around Christmas. Um, but it's fine. <laughs> it's a uh, uh, essentially a sci fi drama. George Clooney directs and stars as uh, this kind of ambitious scientist who Earth is dying, or like some event has made Earth. Uh, potentially uninhabitable. And so he's in this remote uh, substation in um, the Arctic Circle trying to reach this uh, colony mission that has gone out to this moon of Jupiter to see if that planet could be inhabitable for uh, humans Uh, because they're on their way back home and he's trying to tell them to turn back. Uh, And ostensibly it's two separate stories. So it's him on this base where he discovers a young girl who got left behind. And so it's like their interactions uh, on this remote base and trying to contact the ship. And then it's the people on the ship, which is uh, Felicity Jones, David Yellowo, Kyle Chandler, Demi Bashir, um, and then a young actress named Tiffany Boone. Um, And it kind of feels like two separate movies. I don't know. Like, it's okay. I think parts of it worked better for me than others. Um, It gets a little monotonous. It kind of feels like Clooney was like, ooh, you know what? Like, I'd kind of like to try my hand at some of the gravity effects that we did with Alfonso. Like as a filmmaker, I'm sure it felt uh, kind of exciting and ambitious for him to to play around with this kind of stuff. Um, but I don't think it really like sticks the landing. It's also pretty ambiguous throughout. So 
that I think people might find that sort of frustrating. Um, but there are a couple of emotional moments that I think he hits really well. And he's, I want to see him act more. I just think he's such a good actor. His performance is great. It kind of reminded me in terms of its problems, it kind of reminded me of Monuments Men, where it's like, this is a really good conceit, but tonally it's it's off. Yeah. Yeah. And like it, it, and, it, and, it, yeah, and it's totally off because different plot lines feel different. So like the space stuff feels different than the stuff on Earth. Yeah, yeah, because in Monuments Man, isn't like Matt Damon and Kate Blanchett are in like a separate movie or something? They're like in a separate movie, and then there's like a sort of a separate movie with like Jean Dujardin and uh, John Goodman. Like they're off in their own little thing, and then like they kind of come back, uh, like uh, like or then these characters get back together, and it's it becomes oddly kind of like Ocean's Eleven y, but then like other times it's very serious. Like it's weird. It's so low stakes too. <laughs> it just feels we got to very... save these paintings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it, I was worried that Midnight Sky would just be this massive bummer. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It's still a bit of a bummer, but it's not like going to ruin your evening or anything. I don't think it might. Um, so I don't know. I And I think technically I liked Martin Drew's cinematography in it quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I miss the uh, I, I keep wondering if Clooney's ever going to make anything as good as Goodnight and Good Luck again. I mean, he came out the gate really strong. And yeah. I just, yeah, I don't know. But what's going to happen there? Because he's been off for a while now. Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, my wife and I, we feel like so she uh, loved my so-called life and we got it on DVD and we finally finished watching it. And it's only one season. It's only 19 episodes. And I thought it was pretty terrific. So for those who aren't familiar with it, it was came out in 1994, 95. Um, and it's just it was really groundbreaking at the time because up until that point, like shows about teenagers were more like 90210, where it's like these are 30 year olds playing teenagers and it's very soapy and it's very sort of overdone. And my so-called life is more about trying to like what what would a teenager really be worrying about? What are they really facing? What are what are what are the struggles of that? Like and, you know, and how do we make it real and not just like an like a very special episode of the week so that when a character is struggling with alcoholism or a character um, is struggling about feeling pressured about sex or anything like that, like how do we make it feel real and how do we make it work with these characters? And it's just a show that feels very much ahead of its time. Um, and. Like you, you try to imagine, like go back to 1994 and there's like, there's nothing else like this on the air. And like, yes, it has critical acclaim, but like, you know, network executives don't know what to do with it. Um, it's not like, and you see like the sort of the seat and like the, like, we, we haven't reached the point yet where like Dawson's Creek has come along to be like, no, no, we can do shows about teens. Even though Dawson, I don't think Dawson's Creek is a particularly good show. Um, like the WB, that sort of teen aimed network was not there beyond mtv and mtv wouldn't really wasn't really making those kind of shows in the 90s but it's a really fascinating show i mean you know it's weird to look at jared leto now and have a lot of seething contempt for him <laughs> just because he seems like a really annoying person but this was like his breakthrough role and he's really good on this and you're like damn yeah. it leto don't make me fall in love with you he's uh, a good actor he is a good actor yeah uh claire danes is is excellent the whole cast is good uh, to the point where it's like I, after the sh after I finished watching it, I was like, where are they now? Like, why didn't more of these people like sort of have go on to like really big careers? Because everyone is so good. Um, and yeah, like the show is just it really works well. And it's sort of I would say if you it's for me, the show I kept being reminded of was uh, Friday Night Lights. And that's because Jason Cattens, who made Friday Night Lights, was a story editor and one of the writers on My So-Called Life. Um, and he really knows how to sort of make shows where, like, the teens feel real, but also, like, the parents feel real um, and really make those storylines work. So My So-Called Life is is great. I, I'm very glad my wife showed it to me. Um, and I highly recommend it. Yeah, I have not seen My So-Called Life, but it is also my fiance's uh, one of her favorite shows, if not her favorite show of all time. And uh, it's been on our list for a while. So maybe maybe we'll bust that out over the holidays. We have the DVDs. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, as we've said, we're doing two episodes a week uh, from now until the end of the year. So later this week, we'll be talking about the best TV shows of 2020. So please tune in for that. If you want to keep up with us, you should follow us on Twitter. Adam, where can we find you on Twitter? At Adam Chitwood. You can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be with you later this week. Bye.